With a 450 horsepower naturally aspirated 4 litre V8 that revs all the way out to 8700 RPM, our Toyota GT86 race car is a pretty competitive and fun car to drive out on the racetrack. While we've owned this car now for around about 12 months, we haven't actually talked too much on camera about what makes this car tick, so that's going to be the basis of this video. Let's start with that engine, and this is based around the Toyota 1UZFE 4 litre V8. This is a hugely popular engine, particularly in New Zealand and Australia for engine swaps, and you'll find these engines fitted to all manner of different chassis. Now in stock form, these engines actually aren't that inspiring. With the 4 litre capacity, they only produce somewhere in the region of about 300 horsepower. However, with the variable valve timing mechanism on the later VVTI based engine, they do produce quite a nice wide power band. Now, when we got involved with this car, it was actually owned by one of our customers. He had started with the car brand new straight off the showroom floor back in 2012 and he had gone through a variety of different engine combinations, starting with the stock FA20, adding a supercharger kit, then swapping to a turbo kit before deciding that there really is no replacement for displacement. After talking through his options with us, he decided to fit a stock standard 1U ZFE. He also backed this up with a Toyota R154 five-speed gearbox, which is more than capable of handling the torque and power from the 1U ZFE. We only stepped in to supply the electronics and tuning, which is a MoTeC package we'll talk about shortly. Understandably with that stock engine, the power wasn't overly inspiring and after only a few months running the car, the old owner decided that he needed more. Now here in New Zealand, the Toyota 1U ZFE engine is a popular base for stock car engine builds. And in fact, there is a class where these are used as a control engine. They must maintain a 4 litre capacity and they're limited to a 10 to 1 compression ratio. So the owner of the car purchased a ready built race motor. This included a set of stock pistons with that 10 to 1 compression, a set of stronger H beam connecting rods, and really Really where the power all comes from is the modifications to the cylinder heads. The cylinder heads are ported using a CNC porting program and they're fitted with a much more aggressive set of cams and a matching set of valve springs. This is also mated to a modified Holly intake manifold that's more likely to be found on a GM LS V8. The 10 to 1 compression ratio means that the engine is quite capable of running on normal pump fuel with nothing too exotic and no ethanol blends required to keep it happy. Given the increased airflow in and out of the cylinder heads thanks to the cams and the porting. The engine now revs as I mentioned all the way through to 8700 RPM and it actually produces peak power right on that maximum RPM rev limit of 8700. Speaking to the company that was responsible for designing and building this engine, we did investigate revving the engine a little bit further but given that this particular cylinder head is only fitted with a single valve spring, we were advised to maintain a maximum limit of 8700 so we did what we were told. Getting good reliability out of any engine that's used on a racetrack often requires modifications to the oiling system. This is because of the extreme lateral and longitudinal g-forces that we're going to see out on the racetrack. In this case the stock wet sump system was replaced with a relatively basic dry sump system. It uses an external three stage dry sump pump that's mounted on the driver's side of the engine block. This includes two scavenge stages which withdraws the oil and air out of the sump and then pumps it to a reservoir that's mounted in the cabin behind the passenger side of the car. There's another stage of that pump which is the pressure stage. This draws the oil forward from that reservoir in the cabin and then pumps it through the engine. This ensures that regardless what forces are applied to the car out on the racetrack, the engine is always going to have a steady and consistent supply of high pressure oil to all of the important engine components. 
While the original 1UZFE VVTi engine that was fitted to the car did retain the variable cam control, with the much more aggressive cams that use now a lot more lift and overlap than stock, there wasn't the capacity or ability to retain that variable valve timing system. This is because there simply isn't the ability to swing the cams or move the cams significantly before we'd run into problems with piston to valve contact. Now that's not necessarily such a problem in our application anyway because now we've swapped to a six speed sequential gearbox with much tighter ratios and this means that the engine out on the racetrack is normally operating over only approximately a 2000 rpm rev range and when we're only operating under such a short rev range there really isn't so much advantage from being able to advance and retard the cams while the engine is operating. I will come back and talk about that gearbox shortly but before we do that I just want to talk about the fuel system and this is something we actually battled with with this car. Well the stock fuel tank understandably they're not designed to work well with high lateral or cornering forces and in this particular car we can easily see lateral g-force in corners of in excess of 1.2 or 1.3 g. And what that does particularly with a factory saddle tank where half of the tank is on each side of the main north-south drive shaft it makes the fuel run away from the fuel pickup. It obviously doesn't take too long under sustained high G cornering for all of the fuel to run away from the pickup and then the engine starves of fuel. In order to combat that what we've done is we've fitted a radium in-tank surge system on both sides of the tank. This includes an in-tank pump and a built-in surge system or anti-surge baffle system that holds the fuel around the pickup for the pumps. Now this isn't bulletproof though but what we've done here is we've pumped the fuel from both sides of the tank into a common surge tank. The surge tank is fitted with two in-tank pumps that then pump the fuel forward to the fuel rails on the engine. Now this engine is fitted with a fuel pressure regulator in the engine bay, however it is referenced to atmospheric pressure and it runs at a fixed 4 bar. So this is quite similar to what we'd see in a late model car with a returnless fuel system where the fuel pressure is constantly maintained at 4 bar or 58 psi. Now the fuel injectors actually used to inject the fuel are a set of injected dynamics ID 1050Xs. Now if you're thinking that these sound like overkill then granted they absolutely are for a 450 horsepower V8. There are a couple of reasons why we did go with an injector that's a little larger than we needed. One of them was because we did want to run on an E85 ethanol blend for sprint races and this later on is going to allow us to add a lot more compression to the new engine that we've got planned. The other aspect here is that using a large injector means that our maximum injector duty cycle is relatively low even under wide open throttle and high RPM and this can give us some benefit in adjusting the injector timing to optimise the way the fuel is delivered into the cylinder, maximising the fuel and air mixing and hence the amount of power that we can extract from the air entering the engine. The electronics package controlling any late model car is often challenging and in this case we're running a Motec M150 ECU. Now the problem here is that if we just swapped in any aftermarket ECU, well yes we would be able to control the engine and make it run, it's actually the integration with the electronics and the rest of the car that can be problematic. In stock form the engine control unit as well as the ABS system, also the traction control and the dash cluster all communicate together over a CAN bus. Now when we remove the factory engine control unit and replace it with an aftermarket standalone that communication bus is no longer there and we can find that this causes problems with the operation of the other aspects. Another part of the factory car that we're still retaining that relies on that communication is also the electric power steer. So Motec have produced an ECU that replicates the factory CAN bus messaging. This means that all of the factory subsystems still work 
as you'd expect, but allows us complete control over the engine tuning. The particular ECU we are running is a Motec M150 ECU, however it's also important to know that it is running the Toyota GT86 engine swap package. So this is why we can now remove the stock FA20 engine, rewire the M150 to our 1UZFE, we've got complete control over the engine and also the rest of those electronic systems in the car. Using the M150 ECU also allows us to take advantage of some of the advanced motorsport or race functionality such as traction control which is very easy to configure to suit the car, the track, the conditions and the driver's preferences. We've also got launch control in there, a pit limiter which is essential for the endurance racing that we're doing where there is a 40 km an hour pit limit that is strictly enforced with penalties if you are caught speeding. We're also using of course the sequential gearbox with clutchless shifting so incorporating the closed loop gear change control and auto blip on the downshift through the M1 really unlocks the potential of that particular gearbox. Speaking of the gearbox, while I mentioned that originally the car was fitted with a Toyota R154 gearbox, these are a big gearbox that are plenty strong enough, however they're pretty agricultural in their shift quality which isn't ideal out on the racetrack. It feels a little bit like rowing a boat when you're trying to change gear. The other aspect with the R154 is that the ratios weren't ideally suited to what is now a relatively peaky naturally aspirated engine that only makes peak power over a narrow power band. The gearbox that we have chosen is the TTI 6 speed sequential gearbox which is locally made here in New Zealand. Uh, we've seen these gearboxes being proven time and time again in motorsport here in New Zealand so we had the confidence that they were going to be reliable with our application. The other consideration we made when deciding on our gearbox was the ability to have the gearbox serviced inside of New Zealand and be able to source components if we needed to repair the gearbox really quickly and easily. Fronting the gearbox we'll find a Tilton twin plate clutch mounted to a lightweight chromoly flywheel. Now the clutch is actually only used to get the car off the start line or out of the pits. Once the car is moving the clutch isn't necessary regardless whether we're upshifting or downshifting. And a key to this is the Motorsport Systems strain gauge gear lever. This strain gauge gear lever sends a voltage to the Motec ECU that tells the ECU whether the driver is pulling back on the lever for an upshift or pushing forward for a downshift. Not only this, the strain gauge gear lever tells the ECU exactly how hard the driver is pulling or pushing on that lever. So this way the Motec knows if the driver is requesting an upshift or a downshift. On the upshift the driver can stay at full throttle and as I've mentioned no clutch is required for the shift. As the driver pulls back on the lever the Motec knows that the driver is requesting an upshift and will perform an ignition cut, a fuel cut or both to interrupt the engine torque and allow the dogs inside the gearbox to disengage and engage the next higher gear. The downshift is a little bit different here and obviously the driver will normally be off the throttle and probably hard under brakes when downshifting. Here the driver is going to push that lever forward and the Motec ECU is going to automatically blip the drive by wire throttle in order to rev match for the next lowest gear. So essentially this is very similar to how a paddle shifted gearbox works, again with the paddle shifted gearbox the clutch isn't necessary, only this time the, the shift is a function of the the driver actually pushing and pulling on that gear lever. Moving towards the back of the car we are still running the stock Toyota differential however there are a couple of modifications we've made here. We've fitted a shorter 4.556 final drive and instead of the factory Toyota Torsen LSD we're now running a Cusco 1.5 weight clutch plate LSD. While the stock Torsen LSDs do work quite well in a race application what we can find is when we're running over ripple strips or curbs are inclined to end up popping the inside rear tyre off the ground and when that happens with the Torsen LSD all of the torque is fed to the wheel that's now in the air and we instantly lose drive. The clutch plate LSD ensures we're always getting drive put 
to the tyre that's still on the track. We quickly found when we started running this car that controlling the differential temperature was a major problem. In stock form there's understandably no differential cooler so in order to address this we ended up fitting a Cusco rear diff cover and this allows an increase in the oil capacity but more importantly it provides some AN fittings that makes it really easy for us to integrate an external oil cooler. This is controlled via the ECU Master PMU or Power Management Unit and is automatically turned on when the differential temperature gets above 80 degrees C. With 450 horsepower and a bunch of torque now being transmitted to the rear wheels, the stock axles were the next weak link. And while we have actually been battling problems with axle reliability, right now we are running a set of drive shaft shop 800 horsepower axles and so far they have proven to be up to the task of one hour endurance races. While the stock GT86 does handle pretty well on the road, it's obviously never designed to be a race car, so there were some serious considerations needed in terms of the suspension package, the wheel and tyres as well as the brake package in order to make this car competitive and reliable on the racetrack. Starting with the suspension, we're currently running a set of race fab suspension arms in the rear. This is an adjustable lower control arm that allows us to adjust our camber and get that where it needs to be. This is also coupled with a set of race fab uh, trailing arms and an MCA traction mod mount which adjusts the anti-squat properties or geometry of the rear suspension. At the front of the car we've retained a set of stock lower control arms although these are fitted with a set of aftermarket white line suspension bushes. The coilovers that we are running in the car are a set of MCA reds from Australia. MCA produced the suspension as a control Control part for our local Toyota TR86 racing series so they're no stranger to what valving and what spring rates work well in the GT86 chassis. To provide a little bit more adjustability to the chassis and allow us to affect the handling balance we've also got a set of white line adjustable anti-roll bars front and rear. To ensure the car will stop reliably on the racetrack we are running a set of endless brakes on the front specifically this is a four pot caliper fitted with Endless's endurance racing spec pad and a set of endless rotors. We've also got a set of brake cooling ducts feeding cooling air onto those rotors which is essential particularly for endurance racing. At the rear we are currently running a set of D2 brakes off our other car, however we've got a set of endless 4 pot calipers that will be going on the rear over our off season. The wheel and tyre package starts with a Wed Sport wheel and a 17 by 8.5 inch fitment. We actually got three sets of these wheels for the car and two of those sets of wheels are fitted with a Michelin medium compound slick. The third set are retained for wet weather use and are fitted with a set of Hankook wet weather tyres. When we took ownership of the car externally it did look relatively stock and one of the things that we have done over our season of racing is added some very basic aero. Now at the moment we've called this backyard or ghetto aero and it was really what we could get done in the two weeks between two of our endurance racing rounds. We do intend to address this over our off season and produce something that is a little bit more complete and hopefully a little bit more effective. However what we can say is that the car is fitted with a plywood splitter that is covered with a carbon Kevlar weave. We've also got a couple of canards fitted to the front bumper or dive planes as they're also known and this helps produce a little bit more downforce at the front of the car. You can see that there are a couple of braces from the splitter up to a nudge bar or bash bar that runs in behind the factory front bumper. It's really important with any of these aero items to make sure that they can actually support the loads that we're expecting to see and with this particular splitter we can easily stand on the front of it bounce up and down and everything's going to be nice and solid and nice and reliable. There's not a lot of point just addressing one end of the car when it comes to aerodynamics and on the rear of the car we have also fitted a relatively basic rear wing and this currently is just mounted to the boot lid. In the off season we'll also be addressing this with a proper chassis mount making sure all of the aerodynamic loads are transferred down into the chassis rather than just causing the boot lid to bend. We'll also be fitting a better rear wing element that's actually got some 
proven data behind it. While going fast is a lot of fun, we also want to be able to go fast safely. So we've taken the safety elements of this car very seriously. When we took ownership of the car, it was fitted with a relatively basic six point cage. Although there was nothing specifically wrong with that design. One thing we did want to add though was a set of side intrusion bars on the driver's side. This means that if we are involved in an incident where someone drives into the driver's door, uh, we're hopefully going to be protected by that side intrusion preventing injury. The driver's seat is obviously another important aspect of car safety as well as making sure that the driver has a really good feel for what the car is doing. Here we're running a race tech head restraint seat and this is one of their back mounted seats. So not only is the seat mounted at four points on the bottom as with a conventional seat, there is also a rear mount that attaches to the roll cage and this makes sure that the seat is both safer as well as more rigid. We're also running a six point harness to make sure that the driver is held securely in the seat. Out on the racetrack there's a lot going on in a short amount of time and it's very difficult for the driver to monitor everything while trying to get the most out of the car. We've focused here on a few aspects. First of all the car is fitted with a Motec C125 dash. This is mounted in the stock gauge cluster location and in normal circumstances really the driver is only going to be focusing on the shift lights, knowing when to pull the next gear. There is some other information that can be displayed on that dash, particularly for practice and qualifying. We bring up our current lap time as well as predicted lap time, and we can also present a lap gain loss function, basically showing whether we are doing better or worse than a reference lap time. The real value of that dash comes with anything that goes wrong though. It can monitor all of the inputs to the dash as well as the engine control unit and bring up a driver warning if anything goes outside of defined parameters. For example if the engine starts running too hot this can bring up a driver warning. The driver can then look at the dash, see what that warning is and decide on the correct course of action. Now the key with the Motec C125 is that it is logging all of those parameters while the car's out on the track for analysis at a later point. While the car is on the track we can also monitor all of those aspects in real time using the Motec T2 telemetry system. So this uses a 3G modem to send all of that data out from the car and it can then be monitored by a laptop in the pits. With the crew being able to monitor so much information while the car's out on the track, this offers a lot of potential for first of all driver coaching during the practice and qualifying sessions, but also during the race it allows pit stop strategy to be decided upon. We can monitor in the pit the current fuel burn, so we know exactly how much fuel is left in the tank and how much the, the car is using for every lap. This allows us to calculate the pit window when we need to actually pit the car in order to be able to get to the end of the race. We've also got the ability to monitor all of the engine's vital signs and again warnings can come up if anything goes outside the normal operating conditions. An interesting addition to our data logging package during the course of our racing season was the Izzy Racing tyre temperature and pressure monitoring system. These are a sensor that goes inside each of our wheels and allows first of all the air temperature and pressure inside of the tyre to be monitored. This particular sensor also uses an infrared temperature sensor that monitors the carcass temperature on the inside of the tyre. All of that information is transmitted from the sensor wirelessly to a receiver and then that information is transmitted to the Motec C125 dash via CAN. Now in normal circumstances, understandably, the driver is not going to be monitoring this while they're out on the racetrack. However, we've got warnings set up. If one of the tyres receives a puncture and the pressure starts to go down, this information is also transmitted via telemetry, meaning that the team can watch this information from the comfort of the pits. These days it's become quite common to see a number of driver controls or adjustments placed on the steering wheel of GT3 style race cars and we've taken some cues from this and made our own steering wheel. This allows the driver to control some of the key aspects without needing to take their attention off the, the steering wheel and driving the car. In particular on the steering wheel we've got controls for the pit lane limiter. We've also got controls in a multi-position rotary style 
mobile knob for both traction control and launch control. We've also got the ability to control the radio so that the driver can communicate back to the crew in the pits. On top of this, there's also the ability to change the information that has been displayed on the dash as well as the page layout on the dash and of course if there is a warning message that comes up, there is a warning reset button. If we happen to come up on some slow traffic that doesn't want to get out of the way, we've also got the ability to press a button that will flash the headlights multiple times automatically or if things get really nasty, you can always hit the horn. While the car has been a work in progress over the time we have owned it and does retain a lot of the factory wiring, we have needed to add some additional wiring into the car and we made the decision to go with the ECU Master PMU or Power Management Unit. So this is essentially a solid state power distribution module that electronically controls the delivery of power to the various circuits. Now despite the fact that we are using a MoTeC dash, a MoTeC ECU and an ECU master power management unit, all of these units speak together over a common CAN bus, meaning that we can trigger outputs on the PMU via CAN messages from the C125 dash. Currently we're using that power management unit to control the cooling pumps for the gearbox as well as the differential. We're also controlling both of the in-tank pumps as well as the two high pressure pumps inside of the surge tank. One of the key aspects with the PMU is that the communication bus goes both ways so it will also send information on current draw as well as load on each of the channels of its outputs back to the MoTeC C125 dash for logging as well as being able to send that through via telemetry back to the pits. This allows us to monitor all of those channels and can give us some insight into something that may be starting to fail such as a fuel pump that may be starting to draw too much current. At this point we've just completed our first season of racing in the car and unfortunately I'd say that our results have been a bit of a mixed bag. I've also broken a fair few parts along the way. We've also learned a lot and most importantly we've had a lot of fun. As with any race car this is in a constant state of development. We've got a lot of plans for our off season and we can't wait to hit the track next season with hopefully a more powerful and more sorted race car. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.